As you do, I'd like to uh, read a couple of verses out of Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll just set our hearts on the Lord, be, be reminded of uh, some good stuff, some things that make him worthy of our praise. And uh, it says in Hebrews 2, uh, this is kind of halfway through a verse, but at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, to Jesus. <laughs> and isn't that the case? Uh, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Uh, Lord, we are so grateful to you that you, the king of all the universe, Lord of all the earth, uh, the one who um, is greater and above all, humbled yourself. Lord, and that in you, uh, the one who tasted death, Lord, we can have life. We will no longer, we are no longer subject to that death, Lord. Spiritual, but we have life in you, Lord. And so we just ask that now as we sing your praises, you would be glorified in our midst. We know that today we can see your face in part, but Lord, that is the most beautiful thing that we could hope to see. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Minister to our hearts now and be glorified as we sing your praises. Over all the earth, over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream and every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in
Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay, you set my feet upon the rock, and now I know, yes, I love you. I need you, though my world may fall, I'll never let you go, my Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. Oh 
a thing, Lord. You are eternal. All else that is, is made by the power of your hand. Lord, and it's those hands that were pierced for us. Lord, how could we ever ever fathom the cost of your sacrifice, Jesus, on the cross? We could understand if just some man gave his life for someone else. The God of the universe humbled himself, Lord. This is the greatest story. This is the greatest news. Lord, and it changes our lives. And it's because of this that we desire to live for you, Lord. We desire to glorify you in our words, Lord, in our thoughts, in our actions, Lord. We want to lift you up. We want to serve you. We want to serve people, Lord. Take 
As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory It was my sin It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished. Why should I gain? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my rest. Lord, you've done it all. It's the work of your hands. Lord, this is our hope for all eternity that you have died and rose again. This is our firm foundation upon which we stand today that you have done these things. This is our protection against the enemy. This is our love for our brothers and sisters. This is the good news that we have for this world. This is the joy that's in our hearts that Jesus has saved us. And we're grateful to you, Lord. And we ask that you would take that good news and you would change our lives. That our lives would reflect you. That our lives would honor you and glorify you. Lord, we need the wisdom of your counsel. And so we ask that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts through your word now. There is no other life that we have. There's no other truth that we can know other than your scriptures. And so, Lord, fill Randall with your spirit. Speak to us through him. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive. What you'd have for us this evening, minister to us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's take a moment, greet those around us, and then we'll get into the word of the Lord.
Good evening. You're ready. Good. Good. Dave's ready. Okay. Okay. Jordan just asked me to announce that at the parenting conference there will be child care. Right. That's a good chuckle. Right. Yeah. It's like uh, there will be food at the cooking class. Right. So we go. Yeah. No, that's not what I came to talk to you about. Jordan said I could come um, uh, speak briefly for as long as possible about the men's advance, right? <laughs> and so I just wanted to come give you a plug before Randall comes and uh, just shares the word with us tonight. Um, uh, time's going fast. It's coming soon. We go up there uh, Friday uh, evening, late afternoon on May the 3rd. And we are done at 11 a.m. and we're packed up and driving back towards, uh, towards home. And um, I just wanted to come encourage, partly just for... Just ask you guys to pray uh, for God to do what only he can do when we're away that time. And of course, I want to give a plug for, for guys to come. Um, it's just a super impactful time. I know it's one of the things that really ingrained Megan and I in this, this church body that we became part of here. God really used the time away at the men's advance. It was really the first time I'd ever done anything like that, go to a, go to a church retreat. Um, especially with all guys. I just had, had never done it. But the place we go is special. Um, real quick story. The, the property up there used to be owned by a Jewish congregation decades and decades ago and um, uh, in, in the 60s. And then the late 60s, mid to late 60s came around. They decided it was a luxury they couldn't afford anymore. And so they sold, they put the property up for sale and a group of Christian business owners got together and said, we think we ought, to, we ought to buy this and make this a church camp of some sort in the future. And so they did that. And the Jewish congregation, the Jewish group said, hey, we just have one request. Would you, would you always keep a, keep a Holocaust memorial, like just erected and standing on the property? And so that's always, always been honored. And um, now you'll, you'll the, the year they did that was 1967. And the reason they decided it was a luxury they couldn't afford anymore as a, uh, as a Jewish congregation was they wanted to take that money and sell it and send it back to Israel to help fund the war, right? So it's just, we've just seen cool things happen there. We've just seen God move and people get saved and strongholds come down. And uh, one night, if Wes is in here, one night Wes and I, uh, we were having a time of prayer late on Saturday night up there after our session. And uh, Wes, I, and Jason Schultz stood there and prayed, Lord, if there's someone you want to come up here and get prayer right now, would you make their seat get hot? I don't know why I prayed it. I just felt to pray like, Lord, just make their seat hot where they got to stand up and walk forward. And I, only time in my life that I ever seen, uh, I kid you not, a man walked up within one minute and he said, I don't know. But man, my seat got hot, and I just feel like I need to come up here and get prayed for something. Now that is a, I'm, I'm thankful there was two other men that I prayed that with. So there's a, you just think I'm just making up stories about how you know, um, and so never seen it happen again. But that's just what I, we never prayed it again. But God, God did that, right? So um, that's not quite with Elijah was a man after us, and like he prayed and it didn't rain for three years, right? But the seat did get hot. I just implore you guys to come, take a flyer on it, come join us. Uh, but if you're not coming, if you're a lady woman, please pray for us that God would just move and. Um, just that um, I know this, that all the men that God wants there will be there. And so I'm just excited as that, as that guy's in this room. So let me pray for uh, Randall tonight, and then we'll get one. Lord, just bless Randall as he comes to share the word of God. Lord, take his time of prayer and preparation to look into your word. Lord, as you've ministered to him in that, Lord, may you now turn that inside out that we may be blessed in the word as, you, uh, as he shares it and it comes to our hearts. Lord, Holy Spirit, have your way. May we all right now in the quietness of our heart, Lord, just give you permission to do what you want to do, Lord. In all of time, you want to do it tonight in our hearts over this, this portion of your scripture of who you are. And so we just ask your blessings upon that. May the soil be rich because you've made it that way. So plow up the hard places, Lord, and uh, water the good places. And may this, uh, may this portion of your word, this teaching of your word go forth and have its perfect work. And may we say amen. And so all God's people said, amen. Thank you, Ron. Well, let's open our Bibles tonight to 
2 Samuel chapter 19. Who doesn't have a Bible tonight? Anybody? We got anybody need one? Tracy's got a few extras. Oh, one in the back I see. In the back row. Well, I feel like I need to start off with We've prayed. I don't. I'm not. I don't need. I can't top Ron's prayer, so I'm not going to try and do that. But um, I need to tell you tonight. If there was any feedback I got last week, it's that we've never heard a 48-point sermon before. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm promising you there won't be a 48-point sermon tonight. Okay? And I don't have a balloon in my pocket. For any, I don't have any gimmicks at all. <laughs> We're just going to talk about the word. Um, quick review though we ended chapter 18 with David having just learned about the death of his son Absalom if you recall David had asked his military leaders he'd asked Joab, Abishai and Ittai to show mercy to Absalom for David's sake and after a fierce battle in which David's followers had slain 20,000 of the followers of Absalom and Absalom tried to escape on a mule, but his escape had been thwarted by his own magnificent head of hair that got caught in the branches of a terebinth tree and had been found there. And when, when Joab came upon Absalom, hanging by his hair, Joab, not known for showing mercy, not known for trying to find other ways of resolving conflicts, Joab thrust three spears into Absalom's heart. And when David learned the news of Absalom's death, he was deeply, deeply grieved. And he cried out, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Such a deep grief. I attended a funeral yesterday from funeral of one of my former students and she was Ethiopian she left six daughters the oldest was 19 a husband just devastated she had she'd had pancreatic cancer and I don't know if any of you have ever been to an Ethiopian funeral but grief is unrestrained I mean, wailing and weeping and crying out her name over and over again, all the friends and family members. And there were hundreds upon hundreds of people at her funeral. It was a horrible experience if you don't, if you're not comfortable with public grief. One of our core beliefs in the Christian faith is this deep understanding that we all have that we were not created for death. You know, the grief experience or death of a loved one creates this deep recognition that this is wrong. All people sense this truth. Every faith, people who have deep belief, people who have no belief in God, all recognize that we were not created for death. We're grieved by that. Death is a violation of God's original purpose for us. To live in right relationship with him and with each other. And fortunately, God made a way to overcome death, and he offers this hope to us, the victory that Jesus had over death. We still grieve, but now as 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, we do not sorrow as those with no hope. David's grief, though, was compounded by two factors. One was that Absalom was not a righteous man, and we have no evidence in Scripture to suggest that he believed in the promise of a coming Messiah who could reconcile him with God. And second, that David and his son Absalom were now separated by death with no hope of reconciliation between father and son. So David's grief was genuine. Can we, uh, pop, have we got slides back there? Let's pop the second slide up here. Yeah. So it's in this idea of David not being able to reconcile with his son 
um, that sets the tone for David that we're going to read about in these next two chapters. Absalom represented a missed opportunity for reconciliation and restoration. Joab had made sure of that. But David is the anointed king. He needs to be restored to his rightful position, his home in Jerusalem. He needs to get back there. But here's the individuals that we're going to see in addition to them um, uh, tonight. We're going to dig into these a little bit. One is Joab. David has to find a way to be in relationship with Joab after Joab's violent offenses. Another is Shimei. You remember Shimei? It's the guy that cursed David and threw rocks at him. We're going to read more about him and David's attempt to be in restored relationship with him. Mephibosheth. This is Jonathan's lame son. And restoration after having um, uh, gossip and lies been told about him. Barzillai. Barzillai we read about last week who had provided David with um, rest, beds, and um, refreshment after David's escape from Jerusalem. And there's a reconciliation that takes place not with people who you've been in conflict, but with people who you owe, owe a great debt. And David fills that need with Barzillai. Amasa. Amasa was the uh, commander of the armies that Absalom had appointed. Um, and uh, David attempts to reach out to him and have a restoration restored relationship with him. And then finally, uh, there's a guy named Sheba that we're going to meet this week who's described as a worthless man, a rebel, and uh, what happens to him. So once again, we left off with David's grief over Absalom's death, and that's right where we pick it up here in chapter 19, verse 1. And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people, for the people heard it said that day, the king is grieved for his son, and the, for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried out with a loud voice, Oh, my son Absalom! Oh, Absalom! My son! My son! David adored his son Absalom, and despite Absalom's rebellious heart, David loved him still. And that's why David had asked that Absalom be treated with mercy in battle. But again, Joab was not a man of mercy. Let's go to slide three. We've been talking about Joab since Brett first brought him up. Was that almost two months ago? Uh, it, was a, it was a while back. Brett taught here uh, a couple months ago, and, and we played this little game up here. I think you called it Who Lives and Who Dies? And Absalom was one of the faces up there at the beginning. Brett kept crossing them off as they died. I'm sorry, Joab was one of the ones that was up there. That, and Joab was one of the survivors that night. And here's the amazing thing. Now we're near, closer to the end of David's reign as king, and Joab's still surviving. He's still well. Um, and that's remarkable because he was a man of battle. Um, and uh, let's go back. Can you go back one more? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. he was a man of battle, and, uh, and he had been involved in many violent confrontations, but he's still there. But I wanted to dig into Joab a little bit tonight. He is a natural man. He's driven by violence and ambition, and also at times, though, by loyalty to David. But here's the thing. Whether he's loyal to David or to God or to tradition, he's always loyal to himself and to his own wants and desires. Joab is not portrayed as a role model, but here's the interesting thing, and now let's flip to that next slide. That was my fault. Um, Joab is one of the top 16 names mentioned in the Bible. Now, you look at these other names, you would expect we would want Jesus, and, and this doesn't include all the names of God, but, but when we look at Jesus over 1,200 times, David gets mentioned 971 times. You see all these names up there, and you think, yeah, that's right. They should be mentioned that many times. But you get down to number 16, and you say, what? Joab, I was not expecting him in this list. How did he make the top 16 mentions? Of, and this is more mentions than most of the disciples of Jesus and most of the prophets in the Bible. That's a lot of mentions in the Bible. Well, um, I wanted to dig into him a little bit. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, he's introduced to us in the genealogy of uh, First Chronicles. And what we learn is that Joab was one of the sons of David's sister, Zariah. So Joab was David's nephew. Uh, his brothers, Abishai and Asahel, as well as his cousin, Amasa, 
are also important figures in David's life. We're going to read more about Abishai and Amasa tonight. If you remember, Asahel uh, was the one killed by Abner. Um, I think he was maybe may have one of those who didn't survive Brett's message. Um, <clears throat> the next slide, though, tells us that Joab was a valiant fighter. He, we learn how he became David's chief uh, uh, in the army in uh, 1 Chronicles 11, uh, when David was made king over, his, uh, over Israel after Saul's death, David was determined to overtake the city of, it was then called Jebus, but we now know it as Jerusalem, and make it the capital of his new nation, or of his nation, of his kingdom. The city was protected by a strong wall, and it was set high with valleys surrounding it, making it very hard to overtake. The Jebusites were the occupants of the city, and they taunted David about his inability to overtake the city. Um, in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, and it says, David said then to his men, whoever strikes the Jebusites first shall be chief and commander. And Joab, the son of Zariah, went up first, so he became chief. So that, that was an act of great bravery and valor on Joab's part. Uh, Jerusalem became the city of David through Joab's might. And so uh, Joab then led David's armies against various enemies, um, we see him fighting and leading enemies against Aram, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Joab appears to be very loyal to David when it suits him, but he would also challenge David when Joab thought he was not behaving the way Joab thought he should. Take the case of Abner. Uh, this was Saul's former general. Abner had previously killed Asahel, as I mentioned, Joab's younger brother, and it, the death occurred in, a, in battle. But Abner helped negotiate a truce, a settlement, an allegiance between the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's tribe, as well as the elders of Israel with David, who was at that time um, just king over, over Judah. That made David king of a united Israel. And David then made peace with Abner. But Joab didn't like that one bit. Joab appears to challenge David's judgment. Uh, and we read, yeah, uh, it says, when Joab and all the army that was with him came, it was told Joab, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he has let him go, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away so that he has gone? You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in, to know all that you were doing. From, that's all from 2 Samuel chapter 3. Um, so Joab then goes out on his own and murders Abner. Let's look at the next slide. 2 Samuel 3.27 explicitly states that Abner was killed by Joab for the blood of Asahel, Joab's brother. But you know what? There's an interesting little thing I found. Um, Josephus, Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us a slightly different story. And I've got that on the next slide. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, he paints a different picture. Josephus tells us that Joab had forgiven Abner for the death of Joab's brother, Asahel, since Abner had slain Asahel honorably in combat. But Joab killed Abner as a potential threat to his rank after Abner had switched to the side of David and granted David control over the tribe of Benjamin. That was interesting to me. That, that, what, that according to Josephus, um, Joab's murder of Abner was simply because he was afraid that Abner might be appointed to his position as commander-in-chief, a commander of the army. So, um, that's the first time we read about Joab's <clears throat> murderous tendencies. But we also saw that Joab colluded with David in the murder of Uriah. You remember that? In 2 Samuel chapter 11, clearly David was the orchestrator of Uriah's death, but Joab was certainly complicit in carrying out David's wishes. David's plan to have Uriah killed relied on a note sent by David to Joab carried by Uriah. And David wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. And so it was that while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. And then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of David fell and Uriah the Hittite died also. Ultimately, it was David who was responsible for Uriah's death. But Joab's actions showed that his love of God and of God's law, uh, and for the overall well-being of Israel, were easily pushed aside to carry out David's sinful request. 
The next slide, slide 10, shows that Joab's loyalty to David, though, is illustrated in chapter 12. And David was still suffering the consequences of his sin. He was not part of Israel's military battles, but the army was fighting a battle against Rabah under Joab's leadership. His men were about to take the city, but he stopped them, short of conquering the city, and he sent messengers to David saying, I have fought against Rabah. However, I have taken the city of waters. Now then gather the rest of the people and encamp against the city and take it. Lest the city, and it, lest I take the city and it be called by my name. So Joab, I, was, I sense that that was actually Joab looking out for David, saying, look, I'm not looking for the glory of this. This needs to fall to you. And so called David to come, and, and David did come. So there's this long history between David and his nephew Joab. They often saw things differently, and they resolved conflict in different ways. David, even though he was a man of war, he had a number of tools in his belt that he could use to work with people. Um, he often used diplomacy, he used mercy, he used compromise, he used negotiations, all part of his modus operandi. Um, but if you were here last week, you remember that David had pleaded with Joab to be merciful uh, with Absalom. And, uh, uh, and we've already talked uh, about his, his request to those men. David's request didn't make much difference to, Ab to Joab though. When Absalom was found hanging uh, by his hair from a tree. And uh, it's interesting, we, we learn a little bit more about Joab from his relationship with the man who actually found Absalom. Uh, the, the man who found Absalom had spared him and reported what he had found to Joab, and Joab's response was harsh at best. He said he would have rewarded the man if he had killed Absalom. But the man had more integrity than Joab. Uh, slide 13 there says that uh, the man said he would not disobey the king even for a greater reward. And he said that Joab would not have come to the man's defense, but would have stood back when word of Absalom's killer reached David. That was an interesting observation from one of Joab's own men. He said, you wouldn't have stood up for me at that time. You would have just stood back and uh, let me take the, the fall for that. So uh, Joab killed Absalom himself and then had Absalom's body buried under a heap of stones. Slide 15 those when David learned of his son's death, he went into this deep mourning we've already talked about. That was where we picked up this week's study. Joab was just informed that the king was in mourning, but Joab had little patience for weeping over a rebellious son. His tone, though, he confronts David, and his tone does not sound like the tone of a loyal servant. In slide 16, yeah, there you go. Uh, Joab came into the house of the king and said, today you've disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life the lives of your sons and daughters, the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore arise, go out and speak comfort to your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. <coughs> Joab didn't mince words, did he? He'd been with David for many years, but this is one of Joab's brashest acts, as his boldness could have had serious consequences for Joab, because he could have roused David's anger against him. But it's interesting that David did not argue with Joab or challenge him about the tone of his words. David does come down to greet his fighting men and show them appreciation for saving him and the kingdom. Uh, 2 Samuel, Samuel 19, 8 says, Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told all the people, saying, There is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king. For every one of Israel had fled to his tent. That's the people who had fought, the survivors of, the, of uh, Absalom's fighting people. They'd all fled back home. Uh, so remember that David and all his men, they're still in the city of Mahanaim. That's where we left them last week. Absalom had raised his army from the tribes of Israel. Uh, when they returned to their homes, they apparently brought word of David's victory over Absalom. And there was some disagreement among Israel over what they should do next. Picking up there in verse 9, now all the people were in dispute through all the tribes of Israel saying, the king saved us from the hand of our enemies. He delivered us from the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, who we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? Because there was a rising level of support. Say, let's go ahead and put David back into his position as king. David had prevailed in battle 
but he was still in exile from Jerusalem. Some wanted David reinstated. Some wanted him brought back. Uh, David, though, had his own plans for how he wanted to come back, and that involved the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> um, verse 11 says, So King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the words of all Israel have come to the king, to his very house? You are my brethren, and you are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring back the king? If you recall, David had left the priests, Zadok and Abiathar, back in Jerusalem. They had helped send word to him when Absalom uh, was uh, coming out after him. He asked the priests now to speak on his behalf to the elders of Judah. And there may have been a little shaming going on here. Why are you, my own kinsman, not inviting me first to come back? David reminds them that he's one of their brethren and that they should um, take the initiative here. And he goes on and he tells uh, Zadok and Abiathar, he says, And say to Am Amasa, Are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also, if you are not commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. Clearly, there's a little bit of breakdown here between David and Joab. He's, he, he may not have con confronted Joab about his tone or his manner in which he spoke to him, but David's already at this point looking for how can I get this guy out of my hair. <clears throat> David uh, offers to Amasa, the captain of Absalom's armies, a position of leadership in David's reinstated kingdom. This was an olive branch, not just to Amasa, but to all the followers of Absalom. Again, David's using his skills as a diplomat here to try to reunite Israel. <clears throat> Remember that Amasa was the son of Abigail, one of David's sisters, and that made him a nephew to David, just like Joab. We'll see in the next chapter tonight how Joab felt about this olive branch toward Amasa. But for now, David's words to the elders of Judah and to Amasa were successful, and they invited David to return to Jerusalem. In that phrase we just read, um, in that passage we just read, David used the phrase, God do so to me and more. This was a common oath used to reinforce commitment, um, demonstrating a, a desire that this, I'm, I want you to trust me, I'm going to fulfill my words. God do so to me if I don't. It was not unlike someone today saying, if I'm not telling the truth, may I be struck by lightning. But Jesus cautions us in Matthew 5, 33 through 37, not to take oaths like this. He says, again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Um, this wasn't the first time that David had used words like this. I don't know if you remember back when he was fleeing Saul in the wilderness, and, and uh, it, Nabal had declined David's request to send or let his men be refreshed in, uh, by Nabal. And uh, Nabal's uh, tone and manner of response to David so offended David that he said, God do so to me and more if I do not kill every male child in Nabal's household this day. But before that happened, before that could take place, Abigail had come and had brought nourishment and refreshment to David. Circumstances changed and David didn't follow through on that oath. Well, we're going to see tonight that David doesn't follow through quite exactly the same as he may have intended on this oath to Amasa either. <clears throat> but his offer to the elders of Judah was well received. And in verse 14, here in uh, 2 Samuel 19, we read, So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah, just as the heart of one man. So they were all united together and supporting David. So that they sent this word to the king, Return you and all your servants. So at this invitation... From the elders of Judah, David starts the journey home from Mahanaim to Jerusalem. And, uh, what he, and then representatives from Judah, as well as from Benjamin, meet him when he reaches the Jordan at Gilgal. Verse 15 says, Then the king returned and came to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to escort the king across the Jordan. And Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamite, who was from Baharum, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David, there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his 15 sons and his 20 servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king, and then a ferry boat went across to carry over the king's household 
and do what he thought good. Must have been a blessing to David as he reached the Jordan, not only to have the invitation of Judah, but now to have these ambassadors from the tribe of Benjamin. Shimei, if you recall, was from the household of Saul, from Benjamin. And Shimei, we already said, had hurled rocks and curses to David as he fled, but now Shimei realizes the stupidity of his actions and the risk that he'd taken. I mean, David prevailed. What's he going to do now? Well, Shimei uh, is among the first then to welcome David home, and he brought a 1,000 men from Benjamin with him. Now, I'd suggest if you're going to insult a king and then apologize, it's not a bad plan to bring a 1,000 men with you uh, for company. We'll see shortly how David responds to Shimei. Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, also comes to welcome David home. We last saw Ziba in chapter 16 when David was fleeing Jerusalem, and Ziba brought donkeys loaded with bread, raisins, fruit, and wine to refresh David and his party. David had at that time inquired of Mephibosheth, Jonathan's lame son, whom David had protected and invited to eat at David's own table to fulfill his oath to Jonathan. But at as David was escaping Jerusalem, Ziba had told David that Mephibosheth thought to claim Saul's throne, and David had responded by giving to Ziba all that belonged to Mephibosheth. Well, let's, uh, we're going to unpack each of those a little bit. Let's start with Shimei, uh, the slide 19. Yeah, the relationship with Shimei. Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king when he had crossed the Jordan, and then he said to the king, do not let my Lord impute iniquity to me or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my Lord the king left Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart, for I, your servant, know that I have sinned. Therefore, here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph to go to meet my Lord the king. Shimei's apology appears genuine. He fell down before David. He pled for mercy. He admitted that he had sinned. David is moved. I mean, how would you not be when a thousand kinsmen are standing behind Shimei, uh, but, but David's men were not all moved. And so in the next verse, uh, verse 21, we read, but Abishai, the son of Zariah, answered and said, shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Abishai, like his brother Joab, is always quick to use the sword. <clears throat> he was one of David's mighty men, and he's attributed with many great victories. He, uh, his, he defeated 300 men in one battle in 1 Chronicles 11.20, he led a, a, a fight over 18,000 Edomites in 1 Chronicles 8, 18, 12. And in addition, Abishai had saved, saved David's own life against Ishbi Benab, one of the giants. And Abishai had offered to kill Saul when he and David had snuck into Saul's camp, remember, and found Saul asleep. David had restrained Abishai then. Again, Abishai had offered to take off Shimei's head back in chapter 16 when Shimei was throwing rocks and cursing David. And David had restrained him again. Uh, it restrained him with these words that day, what have I to do with, with you, you sons of Zariah? He always, he, whenever he wants to, to uh, restrain Shimei, he, he lump, lumps them in with his brothers and, and calls them all the sons of Zariah um, because they must have had this reputation for, for great violence. So David says the same thing to him on this day in verse 22. David said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zariah, that you should be adversaries to me today? Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? For do I not know that today I am king over Israel? Therefore the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king swore to him. So David spared Shimei that day with mercy that was linked to David's status as king. That's an interesting little side note there. You could actually read that David's statement Today, while I am king over Israel, you shall not die. So Shimei dwelt in David's kingdom under David's mercy and protection all the days that David remained king. But we're going to jump ahead here. Later, after Solomon had been crowned king, and on David's deathbed, he instructed his son Solomon to deal with Shimei in a different manner. This is in 1 Kings chapter 2, uh, and, and we're going to be flipping forth a little between um, uh, 2 Samuel 19 and 20 and then jumping into 1 Kings 2, because a lot of what we read about here this week concludes in 1 Kings 2. But um, verse 8 says, And see you have with you Shimei, the son of Gera, Benjamite from Bahurim, who cursed me with a malicious curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now, therefore, do not hold him guiltless, 
For you are a wise man and know what you ought to do with him, but bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. This reminds me a little bit of the Godfather, doesn't it? <laughs> you know what this man did to me. Make sure he doesn't die a natural death. It's essentially what David's saying about Shimei to Solomon. And what happens? So later on in that same chapter in Second, uh, in um, First Kings chapter two, we see how Solomon executed wisdom in dealing with Shimei. It says then the, in verse thirty six, then the king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there, and do not go out from there anywhere, for it shall be on the day you go out and cross the brook Kidron. Know for certain you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. You've heard the expression, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Solomon invited Shimei to move from Bahurim, where he had previously lived, into Jerusalem, where Solomon could essentially hold him captive. And note that this was not a request. This was a command from the king. And Shimei knew he didn't really have a choice in the matter. So we read on in verse 38 and following. Shimei said to the king, the saying is good as my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. So Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days. Now it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shimei ran away to Achish, um, the son of Maacah, king of Gath. And they told Shimei, look, your slaves are in Gath. So Shimei rose, saddled his donkey, and went to Achish at Gath to seek his slaves. And Shimei went and brought his slaves from Gath. And Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had come back. Then the king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, Did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you, saying, Know for certain that on the day you go out and travel anywhere, you shall surely die? And you said to me, The word I have heard is good. Why then have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I gave you? The king said moreover to Shimei, You know as your heart acknowledges all the wickedness that you did to my father David. Therefore the Lord will return your wickedness on your own head, but King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jeho Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. So we see that this was a conditional reconciliation that David had with Shimei. It was to last during the course of his time on the throne, and David did not himself take Shimei's life, but uh, Shimei eventually paid for his betrayal of David and for his treatment of David, but it was handled by Solomon uh, and Solomon's right-hand man, uh, the commander of Solomon's armies. Um, say that name again, uh, Benaiah. So the next character we're going to meet from back in uh, 2 Samuel 19 is Mephibosheth. We already saw that Ziba had come down to Gilgal to welcome David home, but David now encounters Mephibosheth, and now David hears a different version of the story than what Ziba had told him. In verse 24, 2 Samuel 19, 24, Now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. So it was when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, your servant deceived, excuse me, my servant deceived me. For your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king because your servant is lame. And he has slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore do what is good in your eyes, for all my father's house were but dead men before the lord, my lord the king. Yet you set your servant among those who eat at your own table. Therefore what right have I to cry out any more to the king? So Mephibosheth pays great deference to King David. He admits that he has no right to complain about his condition, that he'll accept whatever judgment that David renders. And David appears to be a little bit uncertain about who's telling him the truth and who's not. His response in verse 29, so the king said to him, why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said, you and Ziba divide the land. That's not exactly what David said. He had told Ziba that he could have all of Mephibosheth's possessions. But now he says, you and Ziba divide the land. Uh, and Mephibosheth's response is, rather let him take it all inasmuch as my lord the king has come back in peace to his own house. So we, um, <clears throat> uh, we don't see Mephibosheth trying to advance his own position here. In fact, he, he seems to not care at all about any gain from this. He's content with whatever David allows him. We know he's already got the position of being allowed to eat at the king's table. So that's basically like, I mean, he's... He's, he's got a great status already where he doesn't have to worry about his own provision. 
On the contrary, Ziba had much to gain by lying about Mephibosheth. And it may have been rash for David to have believed Ziba and give all of Mephibosheth's property to him. David was under a lot of stress at the time. Remember, he was fleeing Jerusalem. He was weeping. He was, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot going on in his life. But I think it might have been better if he had taken the time to try to uh, uh, get the full story before he rendered a decision. Now he basically says, look, you guys split it. And Mephibosheth uh, says, you know, just let him take it. That's not what I want anyway. Um, hopefully we can learn a valuable lesson for it, that we should gather all the relevant information and hear all sides before we um, reach decisions or in our lives. But this is a reconciliation through compromise. And it, the compromise is, uh, this, again, this division of land, sharing it equally or sharing it between the two um, and, and letting them in some ways work out those details. The next character we come on, into contact with here is Barzillai. Uh, so this is, yep, uh, we're introduced to more of those who helped escort David home. And Barzillai had been among those who met David on his flight from Jerusalem. And he had welcomed David uh, to Mahanaim with beds and refreshment for David's party. And now Barzillai is among those supporting David on his return to Jerusalem. Reading in verse 31, it said, And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogalim and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the, door, the Jordan. Now, Barzillai was a very aged man. I have a note in my margin here. Don't mention Jack Norton. Okay. Um, uh, he was 80 years old, <clears throat> and he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzillai, Come across with me, and I will provide for you while you are in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, how long do I have to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between the good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men or singing women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to, the Lord, to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king. Uh, and why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant, Chimham. Let him cross with my lord the king and do for him what seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall cross over with me and I will do for him what seems good to you. Now, whatever you request of me, I will do for him. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. So while Barzillai declined David's offer to travel all the way to Jerusalem, he sent in his place Chimham as a proxy. And according to Easton's Bible Dictionary, Chimham was probably the youngest son of Barzillai. We read later in, in 1 Kings 2.7, again, when David is giving instructions to Solomon about how he should treat certain people after David's death, he tells Solomon to show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be among those who eat at your table, for so they came to me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Now here's an interesting side note to Chimham. We don't really see much else about him. We don't know exactly what David and Solomon did for them. We assume that Solomon followed through on David's request to let them eat at his table. But we don't see anything more about Chimham until we get to the book of Jeremiah. And if you want to check me on this, it's Jeremiah 41.17. And there's this mention there of the habitation of Chimham, which is near Bethlehem. This is 400 years after the time of David. That Chimham received a grant of land, at least it's believed, Chimham would have received a grant of land near Bethlehem, which was retained in his name for at least four centuries. Four centuries is a long time. I mean, we're coming up pretty soon here on the, uh, what, the, the birthday of our nation here. And what are we going to be, 250 years old? So this was, this was a place that retained Chimham's name for 150 years longer than we've been a nation here. So whether granted by David himself or later by Solomon, the grant of this land was very likely part of the fulfillment of David's promise to Barzillai. Well, we're going to um, leave Barzillai here, and we're going to look. Oh, and by the way, this was reconciliation through repayment. David had owed a debt. He felt like he owed a debt to Barzillai. He wanted to make that right. And so it was a reconciliation, not because Barzillai had offended him or David had offended Barzillai, but because Barzillai had showed him a great kindness, and David wanted to return that kindness. So it was a reconciliation through repayment. 
It says, so uh, now the king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham went with him, and all the people of Judah escorted the king, and also half the people of Israel. Just then, all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, why have your brethren, the men of Ju Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all David's men with him across the Jordan? So all the men of Judah answered and said to the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative of ours. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense, or has he ever given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten shares in the king. Therefore we also ought to have more right to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So it doesn't take much to start an argument back in those days. Um, that's not much different than today, is it? Uh, the descendants of Jacob, from those 12 brothers who had their own arguments, right? Um, they, were, they weren't much better uh, all these years later. Uh, what should have been a day of rejoicing about the king's return turned into a quarrel over who gets credit for bringing David back. And what share of David was whose? Note that the 10 shares claimed by the men of Israel meant that um, that, that left out, that was the 12 tribes of Israel minus two, and those two were Judah and Benjamin. And what's interesting about that is that when the nation later splits into two separate tribes, uh, Benjamin becomes basically part of Judah. And uh, the southern tribes uh, remained under the kingdom, uh, with, with uh, Judah and Benjamin together, remained under the southern kingdom. Israel is the remaining 10 tribes. Well, that takes us into chapter 20, and here we read about the rebellion of Sheba. Verse 1, and there happened to be a rebel, the ESV translate that into a worthless man, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, we have no share in David, nor do we have an inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So notice, it's interesting, isn't it, that it's, a, it's now a Benjamite. Um, so they had come down to welcome David. But apparently there was some concern that maybe David was aligning himself too much with Judah and not enough with Benjamin and not enough with the other tribes. Um, so every man of Israel in verse 25, or in verse 2, I'm sorry, deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah from the Jordan as far as Jerusalem remained loyal to their king. So the men of Judah walked with him in the rest of this journey. While meanwhile, the, the men of Israel all storm off. And uh, Bichri threatens to lead a rebellion against him. So here we see um, division in David's kingdom. Um, the men of Israel, they were quick to claim David and said it was our idea to bring him back. But when David doesn't respond the way that they think he should, they're just as quickly abandon him. And um, some think that Sheba's rebellion was the result of David showing preference to Judah, his own tribe, over the other tribes. Uh, but before David can deal with Sheba, he has to first get home. And so we see in verse 3, Now David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion, and supported them, but did not go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. These were the women that David had left behind, and who Absalom, at the council of Ahitophel, had gone into and defiled in the sight of all Jerusalem. David provided housing and food for them as long as they lived, but he never again treated them as part of his own household or like one of his own wives. Verse 4, And the king said to Amasa, Assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the time, than the set time which David had appointed him. Um, slide 22, David makes good on his promise to Amasa, to make him the commander of his armies. David charged Amasa to assemble the men of Judah, to gather the troops, to rally them. And, uh, but he gave him just three days to get the job done. Amasa went to do what David told him to do, but he took longer than the three days allotted. That's not a good way to impress your new boss, is it? David wasn't going to wait to allow Sheba to gather more strength. So David turns to Abishai, Joab's brother, and asks him to lead the pursuit. Verse 6, and David said to Abishai, now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So Joab's men, with the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men, went out after him, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. All right, who are the Cherethites and the Pelethites? We see these names combined together several times here um, 
uh, in different passages. But these were a group of fighters, fierce fighters, very loyal to David. They're probably mercenaries. Um, they made up David's personal bodyguard. These may have been fighters who joined David while he was fleeing Saul in southern Judah and Philistia. 1 Samuel 30, 14 describes the Cherethites as living in the Negev, also called the south near Ziklag, but the same area is described as the land of the Philistines only two verses later. The Bible also refers to both Cher Cherethites and Pelethites um, together, and Pelethites is thought by some scholars to be a ling linguistic corruption of the Hebrew word for Philistine. So these, these weren't... Uh, necessarily people uh, descended from uh, Jacob, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they were men who were loyal to David, and David trusted them when he had a, a tough job to do. They're the ones he called on, and they were for his own personal protection in case uh, some of his own fickle countrymen turned against him, as we saw happens pretty regularly. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's read about what happens to Amasa now. Uh, verse 8 here, chapter 20. When they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa came before them. This is while uh, um, uh, Abishai is leading David's mighty men and the, and the Cherethites and, and Pelethites. And now suddenly, here comes Amasa. And now Joab, and of course, we, you know, if, if, if his brother's going and if he's taking all the mighty men, Joab's going to be in their midst, right? So Joab's with um, Abishai and said, now Joab, dressed in battle armor, on it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at his hips, and as he was going forward, it fell out. Then Joab said to Amasa, are you in good health, my brother? Remember, this is his cousin. And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him, but Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in the stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground. This is not a G-rated story, is it? He did not strike him again, thus he died. David had sought reconciliation with Amasa through diplomacy, but Joab was not much for this kind of strategy. He saw someone in his way or a threat to his position, and he simply went back to his MO. He eliminated the threat. We saw Joab do the same thing to Abner, Abner and Absalom. Now he kills his own cousin, Amasa. The Apostle Paul wrote, if it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And that was David's goal, I believe. In this case... As he had with Abner and Absalom, Joab made an attempt at reconciliation, but it was made impossible for David by Joab. We read on, then Joab and Abishai's brother pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. But Amasa wallowed in his blood in the middle of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. And when he was removed from the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. So um, while David had appointed Amasa to be his commander as a peaf offering and an olive branch to those who support Absalom, killing Amasa could have turned more people away from David. So Joab leaves one of his men to declare that everyone who's following David should now follow Absalom, that Absalom's back in charge, he's leading David's cause. But the sight of Amasa's body dying in the road was a bit much for everyone. Uh, have you ever come upon an accident on the highway and watched traffic grind to a halt as people feel compelled to stare at the accident scene? And the worse the accident, the more rubbernecking takes place. That's kind of how it was that day on the side of the road by Amasa. So Joab's man removed Amasa from the road. He covered him up, and that seemed to solve the problem at the moment because everyone got back to the business of chasing down Sheba. Verse 14, and he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, Beth, Meaka, and all the Berites. So um, Abel, Beth, Meaka is up in the very northernmost tip of Israel. I should have put that on a map, but if you think of the state of Indiana representing Israel, this would be like Angola. Uh, Angola, Indiana is kind of in that same position in this state as Abel uh, Beth Meaka is in Israel. Um, so verse 15, then they came and besieged him. That's where Sheba is now hiding. They besieged him in Abel Beth Meaka and they cast up a siege mound against the city and it stood by the rampart. 
Uh, and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So Joab's, you know, he's relentless. He's got a man he's after. He knows that if he gets this guy, this is probably going to enhance his chances of being back in David's good graces. And um, he's ready to tear down the walls of this city. And so, uh, plus he's gone all the way up through Israel to the city, and he's made a lot of contact with people. He's letting people know as he goes that he's back in command and that uh, David's king. So this city was likely fortified by Saul and David as a place of defense against invaders from the north. But now this fortification is what presents a challenge to Joab. How's he going to get through this wall? So they built a siege mound. They're ready to batter down the city wall until a wise woman of Abel Beth Beaka comes out to try to save her city. Verse 16, then a wise woman cried out from the city, Hear, hear, please say to Joab, come nearby that I may speak with you. And when he had come near to her, the woman said, Are you Joab? And he answered, I am. And she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I am listening. Joab may not have been much of a negotiator, but he was very practical. And if someone offered a way for Joab to accomplish his own goals, Joab was willing to listen. So she spoke in verse 18 saying, they used to talk in former times saying, they shall surely seek guidance at Abel, and so they would in disputes. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. That is not so, but a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David, deliver him only and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, watch, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. And then the woman in her wisdom went to all the people and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. Then he, Joab, blew a trumpet and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. And so Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. To Joab, this was a win-win. The rebel Sheba was dead. The fortified city of Abel Beth Beaka was left intact, and Joab could go home and report another victory to King David. Maybe David would now restore Joab to his position of commander of David's armies, and this appears to be exactly what happened. Verse 23, this is about David's government officers. And Joab was over all the army of Israel. But note this, Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites, David's most loyal fighters. Adoram was in charge of revenue. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. Shiva was scribe. Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Ira, the Jairite, was a minister under David, was a chief minister under David. So David appears to be reconciled now to Joab. He's put him back in his position as commander in chief of the armies. But there's a difference between reconciliation and forgiveness. I don't think David ever fully trusted Joab again. We see that he appointed. Joab is commander of the army that goes out, but David appoints Benaiah over his own personal bodyguard. And Benaiah's loyalty to David and later to Solomon was never questioned. Let's look ahead again to 1 Kings chapter 2 at what David said to Solomon as Solomon was dying, as David was dying, excuse me, and Solomon was anointed king in David's place. Let's look in verse 1. Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do, and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way and walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, You shall not like a man on the throne of Israel. And he goes on here in verse 5. Moreover, you know what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me. This is the godfather speaking again. <clears throat> and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel. To Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. He doesn't even mention Absalom here. I don't even know if David fully knew exactly what, what Joab had done. But anyway, he says, and he shed the blood of war in peacetime and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist and on the sandals that were on his feet. Therefore, do according to your wisdom and do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. So later in the same chapter, I think this is about verse 31, he says, uh, Joab speaking to Benaniah, Benaniah says, uh, go strike him, Joab, down. And the king said to him, do as he has said, 
and strike him down and bury him, that you may take away from me and from the house of my father the innocent blood which Joab shed. So the Lord will return his blood on his head because he struck down two men more righteous and better than he and killed them with the sword, Abner, the son of Nair, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, the commander of the army of Judah, though my father David did not know it. Their blood shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his descendants forever. But upon David and his descendants, upon his house and his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. So Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, went up and struck and killed him, Joab, and he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king put Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, in his place over the army. So um, this was uh, the final, I guess, result of, of uh, Joab's violent life. He was killed violently. He was actually killed holding onto the horns of the altar um, and uh, seeking mercy, but he got none. He, never, he didn't give it. He didn't get it. So slide 23, a quick summary. So David was restored back to his throne in Jerusalem. Mephibosheth was shown mercy <coughs> under David's and David's continued favor by allowing him to continue to eat at the king's table. Barzillai, his kindness was repaid through Chimham, his youngest son. Amasa, a reconciliation was thwarted by Joab, although David made reasonable attempts to try to put Amasa in, in a position in his army. Sheba was dealt with by Joab, and Joab was restored as commander of David's army, but not forgiven, and later killed by Solomon through Benaiah. Shimei was shown mercy, but not forgiven, and later killed by Solomon and Benaiah. I just want to talk for a moment about peacemaking. Relationships are difficult. People are, people are difficult sometimes, aren't Amen. they? Amen. <laughs> uh, and restoring broken relationships can be very difficult, but I believe we're called to forgive others for their trespasses, just as our Heavenly Father forgives us through Jesus Christ. Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. I think that's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. And I think there's something to the order of being restored first to your brother and then before God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if, you're, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will forgive, will also forgive you. And then here's this line that's just, this one is a gulper. It says, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive yours. Forgiving others is what opens our hearts to receive God's forgiveness. Being reconciled for others, even willing to, being willing to work toward reconciliation, may involve many components, including repentance, seeking forgiveness, taking responsibility, making things right. Reconciliation may not happen with everyone. But Paul said, and we've said this already, if it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Sometimes there are factors outside of our control, just as there were with David's. But nevertheless, we're called to a ministry of reconciliation and we're called to forgive. In a piece called, in a, a pamphlet called Peacemaking Principles that Tracy lent to me, there are four principles of forgiveness I want to share with you. If we say we've truly forgiven someone, if we're reconciled or even reconciling with someone, uh, then here's what we should be saying. This is what should take place. Um, in our hearts toward the forgiven person about the incident or the offense that caused um, the issue to come up. And the first is that we're promising that I will not dwell on this incident. I'm not going to continue to think about this and let this control me. I'm letting this go. If I say I forgive you, I'm dropping this. I'm not going to continue to dwell on it. That means I'm not going to bring up this incident and use it against you. It also means I'm not going to talk about this incident with other people. And finally, I'm not going to allow this incident to stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. That's what forgiveness is. And through forgiveness, God tears down the walls that our sins have built. He opens a way for a renewed relationship with him. And that's exactly what we can do when we forgive as the Lord forgives us. We release the person who has wronged us from the penalty of being separated from us. We do not hold wrongs against others, 
We do not think about the wrongs and we do not punish others for them because that's what God does for us and that's what he calls us to do for others. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for these chapters about David and his reconciliation and restoration attempts with all these people as he came back into Jerusalem to resume his role as king, to take his place on the throne. Help us, Lord, as we work with others in our lives, whether it's friends or family members, classmates, whether it's those we come into contact with here at Horizon, or whether it's those we encounter out in, um, in the, on the streets of this city, we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to be good ambassadors for you. You said that um, we would be known for our love for each other. Help us to demonstrate that by forgiving those with whom we hold offenses, Lord. Help us to be good forgivers, uh, just as you have forgiven us. Go with us this day, we pray. Guide us tonight. Keep us safe, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night.